with that, I'd like to introduce our main speaker today, Matt Stoll. Matt joined Compass in 2002 and has served as the, as the executive director of the organization since 2004. Under his direction, the organization has focused on developing and retaining collaborative and cooperative partnerships with the Treasure Valley communities and with local, state, and federal planning agencies. Prior to his tenure at Compass, Mr. Stoll worked at the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality for nine years. He holds a Master's of Arts degree in Geography from Arizona State University and a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Geography from the State University of New York College at Geneseo. And Matt, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Appreciate the opportunity to, well, I appreciate your introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with the conference participants and share some of my ideas. Uh, let me get my slideshow set up. Um, and I wanna thank uh, particularly um, Dr. Lowry and the planning committee for inviting me to serve as the keynote speaker. Um, it's an unusual thing for me. Um, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts. So as was mentioned, um, my name is Matt Stahl. I'm the executive director of Compass, uh, the Community Planning Association of Southwest Idaho. I'm here to share my thoughts uh, on adapting to changing landscape. It's frozen. Um, I'll start with a brief overview of Compass, then take a look at the changing landscape we see and challenges and opportunities that we all face. I'll briefly touch on what Compass is working on relative to those opportunities and conclude um, with some needs that we have identified that you're, you likely also share. Hopefully we can move forward together to address many of those. Compass is the forum for regional collaboration in Southwest Idaho that helps maintain a healthy and economically vibrant region, offering people choices in how and where they live, work, play, and travel. We serve as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Ada and Canyon Counties. Our mission is to conduct regional planning, facilitate coordination and cooperation amongst stakeholders on various issues, serve as a source of information and expertise on issues affecting Southwest Idaho, and assist member agencies in accessing funding to accomplish local and regional goals. We fill four regional roles. We plan as a metropolitan planning organization. We develop the long range transportation plan for the region. We are in the process of updating our plan, Communities in Motion, to look to the year 2050. We implement plan, our plans. We provide technical expertise in the areas of geographic information systems, data, analysis, demographics, and more. And then we also facilitate regional cooperation and collaboration amongst our members. As they say, the only thing that stays the same is change. We are all likely facing many of the same changes. Let's take a brief look at some of those. The West is experiencing tremendous growth. With that comes shifts in the demographics of our populations. Additionally, we have significant changes in transportation technology, but unfortunately, few changes in how we are funding our transportation system. Let's look at each of these in a little more detail. Growth is a huge issue that affects everything we do. Idaho, Oregon, and Washington are all exceeding the national average for growth. Idaho is actually the fastest growing state in the nation by percentage, um, and Compass's planning area is the fastest growing region in the state. Over the past decade, we have averaged 1.7 new people per hour in our planning area. That's from 2010 to 2019. We thought with COVID, uh, growth would slow in our region, but initial indicators point to a faster growth rate during the pandemic. Um, we'll have a better idea once we see the census numbers on where we're at. We are hit hard with growth and all that comes with it. 
In addition to more people, the demographic characteristics of our population are changing as well. First, we have the silver tsunami, or aging baby boomers. Nationally, the population over 65 is expected to double by 2060. That will cause a huge shift in work arrangements and leisure time. Many of these boomers will not be working eight to five, but will have more trips during the day and more needs for recreational trails, for leisure, and for public transportation to remain independent as they age. The other large cohort is the millennials. They want more choices in where they live and how they travel. The two groups actually have many similar wants and needs. We need to anticipate and plan for those evolving needs and not just rely on the same old plans or processes. Technology is also changing. It may be the most difficult thing to plan for as technology grows and morphs at breakneck speed. New technologies can lead to uncertainty and questions. What will be the long-term impacts of scooters and other types of micro-mobility? Are they a flash in the pan or are they here to stay? I understand you'll be discussing micro-mobility on Monday. That should be a very interesting conversation. Will ride hailing continue to grow? How will it affect public transportation? Many people say they don't want autonomous vehicles, but they are coming. How do we plan for them? We saw a huge increase in telecommuting with COVID-19. Will the trend stay or will we go back to business as usual? Initially with COVID-19 and the stay at home order that we saw in Idaho, um, we saw VMT vehicle miles travel drop tremendously during that two month period. Now as once stay at home order um, has been removed, we're seeing our VMT actually coming back to pre-COVID numbers. And on some segments, those uh, the VMT is actually exceeding pre-COVID numbers. So that's where hopefully we can get a better understanding of what's going on through big data. Big data gives us more information than ever before. It is one way technology can help us plan better. What additional data will we be able to mine in the future? Finally, funding, where the lack of change is the issue. While transportation needs increase, funding remains stagnant, leaving large gaps between what we need and what we are able to afford. There are many reasons for this. The federal fuel tax has not been raised since 1993, and there is no stomach nationally to raise it now. More fuel efficient vehicles are generating less revenue per mile driven than the older gas guzzlers. And so we're not keeping up with inflation um, because of the method that we're collecting the gas tax. And there has been no movement nationally to embrace newer revenue sources, though Oregon has taken the lead on a per mile fee. In addition, in Idaho, as in many Western states, we receive more federal funding than we contribute about $1.60 for every dollar we put in. There's always the concern that that could change, which would leave us in a even more, even more dire straits financially in trying to build the infrastructure that we need. The lack of adequate funding underscores the need to ensure our investments are based on solid data. With these issues as a backdrop, what are some of the challenges and opportunities we are facing? Some of the challenges include uncertainty, competing demands, and the difficulty of making high stakes and long-term decisions in our rapidly changing atmosphere. The first of these is uncertainty. Changes of all types are happening faster than ever. How do we proactively plan with that level of uncertainty? COVID-19 provides a perfect example. It transformed the world of teleworking overnight. Will that last? We've also seen huge increases in walking and cycling. Will those last? 
what will the long-term impact of COVID-19 be on public transportation? How about freight? More online shopping leads to more delivery vehicles in our neighborhoods. What is the ripple effect? Will we also see drones and robots delivering our pizza? On top of that, we have land use impacts. Will there be less demand for parking since we're shopping online? Less demand for office buildings if we're working from home? Will it change the type of housing people are looking for? These are all unknowns and they are all interrelated. The big question is, how do we proactively plan in the midst of rapid and sweeping changes? How do we adapt? I know you'll be discussing many of these issues later today and throughout the next week. Next week. These are important conversations. Another challenge we all face is competing demands for limited resources. As I mentioned before, there's not enough funding to meet transportation needs. So we have to make tough decisions and there's not one right answer. Do we focus on maintaining our system or expanding for growth? How do we balance roadways versus public transportation needs? Do we invest in urban areas or rural areas? These conflict points become more heated in this day of limited funding. And so these will be challenging conversations that we'll have both at the federal, state, regional, and local levels. And especially with rapid growth we are experiencing, we have competing demands for land use. We see the pressure of new development competing with the need to preserve right of way for future projects. We also have the ongoing debate of how to grow. The only thing people hate more than sprawl is density. Embroiled in these issues are also concerns over the loss of farmland and protecting private property rights. None of these are easy answers. Yes, now more than ever, the stakes are high. How do we balance rapid change with competing interests and make the right decisions for 30 years into the future? One way is to use data-driven analyses to inform decisions and to help our policy officials. MAP21 brought performance-based planning to the forefront on a, large, on a national scale. Um, for folks that may not know, MAP21 was the federal transportation bill at the time moving ahead for progress in the 21st century. Locally at Compass, we have been using performance-based planning since 2006. I'm sure many of you have been doing the same for years as well. To truly use a performance-based planning approach, we need good data and good analyses. We also need a good way to report so that we can use that data to improve our programs and decisions. At the same time, it's important to note that data cannot make the decisions for us, but it can provide a solid basis for those decisions. As an example, I'll share a few ways Compass is developing tools and collecting, analyzing, and using data. We developed a performance measure framework with funding from a SHARP II grant in 2015. This tool quantifies the impacts of transportation investments on the transportation system and other quality of life performance metrics. We, also, we are also using a fiscal impact tool to analyze the fiscal impacts of growth on local jurisdictions. We started with phase one, which we used at a regional scale for scenario planning. We are now working on phase two, which will be used for more local and community planning. We own and operate automated bicycle and pedestrian counters throughout our region. These provide quantitative data on bike and pedestrian use. We have 15 permanent counters that provide consistent data and long-term trends um, for specific locations, 24-7, 365. We also have 24 portable counters that provide site-specific data for short, short periods of time to assist local planning. We have a data bike that we purchased through a FH, an FHWA technology transfer grant. We just started, 
pardon me. Lost my place on that. We just started operating it this summer. It measures roughness and other metrics to provide quantitative data on pathway conditions to use in prioritizing pathway maintenance projects. Finally, we purchased big data to fill gaps as needed. Reporting is key to having a feedback loop for improvement. In our TIP achievement report, the, we discuss how projects funded with federal funding will or should impact regional and federal performance measures. These are predictive measures and look at individual projects. In our change in motion scorecard, we report on how the region is doing on regional and federal goals in the long range transportation plan. It compares trends and current conditions to those goals to see if we are moving the needle. With the need for more information to support data-driven decisions, let's take a look at some potential partnership opportunities that could exist between um, local units of government, regional entities like ourselves and state government, and research institutions. I'll highlight some of the needs our staff have identified. Many of you likely have similar needs or research interests. One need is for more and, and better benefit cost data and analytical tools. Having good solid data allows us to analyze and compare projects based on a solid foundation, helping to move away from anecdotal data or gut feelings or the, that's how we've always done an approach to selecting which projects to fund. For example, pavement. What is the point of diminishing returns in terms of better or more expensive treatments? Or with small projects, we could use a quality tool to help forecast the economic benefits and costs of small projects, such as pathway projects. We have a tool like this for large projects, TREDIS, but not for small scale projects. And non-capacity projects, how can we measure the benefits of operations transportation demand management or ITS projects. How can we compare those against capacity projects so that our decision makers on our boards or um, senior management can make an informed decision on whether a non-capacity project should move forward over a capacity project. We could also use better data to understand impacts of transportation projects on related issues, such as travel and tourism. The FAST Act requires that, that we address this. Data to help us understand this relationship will help us in our planning. Health, how can we measure how a transportation project will impact health? For example, if we add a bike lane, will it increase cycling? If so, to what extent does it impact public health? Life saved. FHWA's crash modification factors that we use in our TIP achievement report provide us information to help forecast the impacts of projects on reducing crashes, but not on saving on life saved or severe injuries reduced. Knowing that would help immensely not only because federal performance measures require us to measure fatalities and severe injuries, but more importantly, because we want to focus on projects that will save lives, not just reduce fender vendors. Finally, how do we forecast and measure less concrete or newer issues, such as mode share, success in moving people as opposed to moving vehicles, and the impacts of technologies on noise, safety, and more. I've just listed a few examples of opportunities that we see at Compass. I'm sure you have many of the same challenges and likely some that are not on our radar screen, yet, at least not yet. But working together and sharing resources, we can get better data to improve our knowledge to inform decision making to address current and future challenges to improve the quality of life in all of our regions. What you're doing here is coming together to share research on solutions to common problems. 
Your work will benefit all of us. I encourage all of us to continue to work together to better understand the issues and develop innovative solutions. Thank you for inviting me here today and for all the great work you're doing. I wish you a successful and productive conference. If you'd like to reach out to me, uh, you can contact me via my email address, which is mstall at compassidaho.org. I'd also encourage you to check out uh, the Compass website, which is www.compassidaho.org. And then for those of you that love social media, feel free to get on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we have a YouTube account too. And with that, I will turn off my sh screen share. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. We, uh, we uh, appreciate your words. This, this year, our conference theme was mobility for a changing society. And as, as we see, Matt, you, you touched on that. It's no surprise that that would be a theme for you as well. This has uh, been a remarkable year, seeing lots of different things. We'll, we'll take some time now for some questions. Um, so if anybody has a question you'd like to put forward, you can do it in the question and answer box that's on your monitor. You can also direct them to me specifically um, with, uh, with the chat room. Um, so one, one question that, that, uh, that has come forward, there's, there's talk more and more about the concept of, uh, you're, in a, you're the MPO of a large area, that there's talk more and more of uh, being uh, the need to think of mega regions. And out here in the West, we're kind of spread out city to city. But has it already begun that in the Boise area, you're having to think about what neighboring MPOs are doing, and maybe even as far as Salt Lake or over in Oregon or Washington? Has, has, that, has that started to happen? Yeah, actually, we, we've started the conversation, um, gosh, I think it was probably in the mid 2000s. Um, so going on 15 years ago. Um, and there's really two, we're kind of caught in between two regions and discussions. One is the Intermountain West, so that would include Arizona, New Mexico, um, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, um, and ourselves. And then more recently, uh, we've invited Spokane into that discussion. And then there's another group from, um, from Washington, Oregon, and Idaho that we meet periodically, um, talk about our common cha challenges that we're facing, um, as metropolitan planning organizations or regional councils um, and seeing, sharing information. And then with the Intermountain West group, we've actually talked about how can we leverage that voice at the federal level with our congressional delegations. And if we could come up with um, some common things that we agree upon, um, we actually could advance a lot of the discussions on the transportation bills that would help um, Western and developing um, regions. I, I suppose transportation just continues to grow its impact from, from a city to an area to a region. And now you're saying things like Western and, and, and thinking about that, especially when it comes to freight moving. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, the Intermountain West group, uh, there's been discussions about the I-11 corridor um, going up from Mexico up to Canada um, for the movement of freight. Um, part of the key challenge, again, with a lot of these discussions, although it's identified in the various transportation bills as an eligible corridor, it's funding. Um, and with um, Congress not doing anything uh, with the gas tax since 1993, uh, they're having to supplement um, the revenue stream or the, the highway trust fund with general funds. Um, and so we're not really keeping pace with inflation um, through the annual, not the annual, through the transportation bills. Another question, uh, someone noted that much of your presentation, you talked about uh, the importance of data, and we know that the FAST Act is emphasizing more and more data. The, fe the federal government continually tries to emphasize data. What, what are some of the data gaps that you see are needed? What data is pressing issue for, for your MPO? You wish um, you had. Data you wish you had. Data I wish I had. That, that's where I got to have my model. Um, you know, where we're, the most basic one is going to be on um, 
vehicle counts. We don't have enough vehicle counts throughout our region um, as far as um, getting a better understanding of the trip patterns. Um, so we end up buying, again, that big data and supplementing um, through various sources. Uh, when you travel around with your cell phone, uh, we're getting that information as far as um, your speed, where you're getting uh, delayed, et cetera. Um, the other one is, again, on, as I mentioned earlier, is on fatalities and serious crashes and getting a better understanding of that. Um, we would like to have a better understanding of what the, what the needs are for autonomous vehicles to function in our area are going to be. Um, the other point that we're trying to get a better understanding is on the freight travel. Um, we've done some high level um, studies as far as whether freight is just passing through and whether the concept of a bypass would be beneficial. The initial data that we have gathered through that process is that um, because we are the most remote metropolitan area in the nation, so the next large metropolitan area is five hours away from us currently, um, freight movement, they stop and have a purpose of coming into the Boise area. So the concept of a bypass doesn't work, but we need to improve the data to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, another part that we'd like to improve upon would be um, getting a better understanding of how much freight is go actually going through um, on the rail lines. Uh, UP is rather uh, protective of that information and trying to, get, trying to get that information from them is difficult um, at times. Um, I can ramble on about a bunch of other ones. Well, I, I see. It sounds like freight is a is a key area of data, but also just new data sources that that you're excited for with with phones and and whatnot. So again, to the audience, you feel free to ask some questions. It seems as there's one person who maybe has their uh, audio on the question thing. It keeps bringing up odd questions, but I do have a few here that I'd like to touch on. Um, one one person noted um, your discussion on uh, evaluating projects and was curious to hear your thoughts on the difference between project evaluation and program evaluation where you're, and what's the value of that? How would you do that when you're wanting to evaluate a, a collection of projects? And how did that, you know, not, not just for selection purposes for, for the tip, but for evaluation afterward, how do you evaluate a whole program? Um, that's, that's the primary benefit of our, not the primary, that's one of the benefits of our performance measure framework is that we are able to be reactive and evaluate the overall program and the investments and whether we're moving that needle. Um, where we have struggled is trying to implement that performance-based metrics into project identification beforehand and identifying what the benefit of that project would be. The challenge is, is trying to quantify the value um, in a proactive manner of investing in public transportation projects versus uh, capacity projects. Um, also going along with um, bike pedestrian facilities, because that seems to be with limited resources, those are the conflict points that we're running into. And we'd like to get a more robust data stream and analytical tools, quite frankly, to help us um, evaluate those projects so that people are comfortable and they don't feel that the system is, the evaluation process is rigged against certain projects or mm -hmm. for certain projects. Mm -hmm. Continue a challenge with, with MPOs to show the transparency and, and that it's not, try to avoid the bias. Yes. So an, another question about uh, touching on a comment you made on parking, P parking demand and parking use and parking revenue is is constantly changing. Um, what is does Compass have any initiatives that that they're directly looking at this fluid situation that we see? Um, not on parking. As far as the downtown parking, um, we have a park and ride lot study that we're doing um, to try to get a better understanding of 
where our park and ride lots need to be um, across the region. Um, the point on the parking, the parking I was making was on the land use changes. And um, as we see, one of the things I didn't mention is we heard from a large employer that because of the pandemic, they went remote. And what they realized was they can do their jobs remotely. And this is about a 500 person um, employer in downtown Boise that they were going to continue having their employees working from home after the pandemic is done. Um, and they were no longer going to be renting the office space that they have downtown. That's going to have a ripple effect as far as um, the service um, industries that are in downtown, restaurants, et cetera, as far as you're losing 500 people that aren't going to be going out for lunch. And so the question is, do we need to, do we need to have the requirements for parking, um, three spaces per um, tenant or uh, per employee that they have, um, requirement as part of our land use decisions? Um, so you, you, we, you talked about change with the impacts of COVID. I'm, I'm, one, one person is interested to know, um, has it made any immediate changes in the way you're going to be doing things? Are, are, you're, you're constantly having to predict the future, plan for the future, but was there anything with COVID that, that just really opened your eyes? This is going to be different. We're going to be doing things differently now. Uh, you know, since we're, I've been asked that quite a bit. Um, and since we're still in the midst of it, we're still gathering, trying to gather our, our data and get our bearings on what's going on. Um, when the pandemic started, I would have, and quite frankly, the recession started, I would have thought that the housing market was going to crash um, and it would have slow, slowed down um, the number of the growth that we we're experiencing. And that hasn't been our experience. Every month we get new reports that the median house home price in Aiden Canyon counties has gone up. Um, when the stay at home order occurred, again, um, the VMT on all of our key corridors crashed to about 25% of where they were um, pre COVID. And uh, we had some policy officials that were asking, hey, what happens if we were able to promote more teleworking? Um, would we have the same impact? And that would decrease um, our need for capacity um, on the ro roadway system. And the reality is, once the stay at home order was lifted, we started seeing, and we're at now, at the same VMT levels we were pre COVID, and in some key corridors, we're actually above it. Um, and it really, if you start analyzing the stay at home orders, um, it was folks that in the, are in the service industry, they weren't working from home. I was working from home. Um, a lot of the white collar jobs, people are, were working from home and able to. But the service industry folks, that those are the ones that don't have the ability to work from home, they're out of, out of jobs. Um, and so I didn't really think it was gonna have that much of an impact. But now we're hearing about employers like the one I mentioned, the 500 employees, um, that they're not coming back to downtown Boise. They're gonna continue working from home. So is that gonna have, what sort of impact is that gonna have on the commercial office space that folks or development community is currently building? Talking to developers, they're very concerned about that from a commercial office space standpoint. Residential, we don't have enough houses to meet the demand. Houses are selling within a couple of days of when they go on the market in the region. The, um, uh, as one of the attendees, Mark Hallenbach, just uh, jumped in with a question. He, he, he notes that same idea that you're saying that there has been this uh, move with Facebook, Twitter, others saying they're no longer going to require their employees at home. But then there also seems to be kind of a, a whiplash effect and now it's going back the other way that some are saying, actually we do want to be in some form of office space have you have you heard it kind of has it has it vacillated you know six months later now we're hearing about 
the the need for personal interaction and off and uh, training that's being lost because of online. Um, I have I, I have. What kind of communication do you? Because you, you're mentioning this this uh, employer, is it something that you have to reach out to them to hear, or they come and they're talking to you? What's your communication channels with with folks like that? On on that one, it was I read it in the news like everybody else did. Um, in the development community with commercial developers and stuff, it's uh, conversations that I have with them. Um, where they're asking for inf data and information that we provide um, and then the conversation just starts up. Um, in terms of from a government sector standpoint, uh, I've heard, yes, folks are saying that they, from a productivity standpoint, they'd like to get their employees back in the office. Some, some government uh, municipalities have already had them back in the office working um, once the stay-at-home order was lifted. Um, my own personal experience with my staff, we've actually been able to get um, more staff out to training opportunities like this because they're provided virtually um, and it's at a lower cost for us. Um, it's, we're looking at our office space, we're able to get, we're, I'm keeping it at half of the people at any one point in time are in the office and spreading it out. Um, maintaining appropriate social distancing, et cetera. Um, but I have some employees that are like, you know what, I can work from home as well as I did in the office. Um, some employees are saying they, they're looking forward to the day when they can come back into the office. Mm -hmm. I think the, the jury's still out on how we're going to react. If I was a betting person, uh, which sometimes I am, um, <laughs> I would say based upon how we are as humans, we have a short memory, um, uh, we have a short attention span. And so I want to see where we are six months once a vaccine and appropriate therapeutics are in place, how the private sector and the public sector are reacting. Um, we are social beings. We like to have that interaction. Um, but there's also just the the bottom line for the private sector and even the public sector on how can I deliver my services in a more cost-effective manner, um, whether that's increasing my profit margin from the private sector standpoint or um, saving the taxpayer um, money from the public sector. Um, I, I'm cautious about making decisions mid-pandemic or in the pandemic. That's where I think we need to have more data and I think that's where research institutions like the Pacific Northwest um, group would help us out in getting a larger data set than just our metro area. Mm -hmm. Again, looking at d data outside of broader and broader areas. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna continue to do questions for a few minutes until the hour. That leaves us about eight more minutes of questions. And I, I'm starting to have quite a few come through. So I'll just continue to go down the list here. Um, you, you've touched on this a little bit, but the, the future of public transportation, well, what, what's your vision for it? What do you see happening now? Not just because of what COVID has done to public transportation, but even before COVID, there are changes happening with the advent of shared bicycles and scooters and what Uber and Lyft are doing to public transportation. What, what again, not, not that you have a crystal ball, but what are some of your thoughts on the future of, of uh, transit, public transportation in your area? Um, well, it's, it's challenging. Um, and we'll talk to Kelly uh, shortly. Um, Idaho, when I started in this position, Idaho is one of four states that did not have a dedicated funding mechanism for public transportation. Now, we are one of two states, Idaho and Mississippi. Um, and that means that uh, the executive director for Valley Regional Transit is always having conversations with local elected officials um, about how to use their, if they are willing to contribute um, their property tax or other revenue streams to maintain and operate the public transportation system in our region. Um, and that's difficult when uh, property tax is probably one of the most hated taxes in Idaho. Um, and folks are always saying that it's too high and it needs to be reduced. 
Um, and yet the local elected officials are using that revenue stream to fund their other programs, including first responders and trying to maintain law enforcement, fire services, et cetera, um, for the citizens. So it's a difficult uh, decision that they have to make. Um, Pre-COVID, I looked at um, rideshare programs and also the other micromobility um, opportunities as being supplements to help our um, folks get from that last, from where their drop-off point on the bus system to where they needed to go, whether it's work or um, going to um, for groceries, et cetera, um, or whatever their destination was. With COVID, um, I think it's gonna be a challenge and Kelly will talk about it some more as far as getting people comfortable because we, you know, one of the first things that uh, federal government and state government said was recommended not using public transportation because of um, dense or the um, closed environments and numerous people being in there and uh, you have constant people coming in and out and there's a potential for spreading the virus. Um, I think that's going to be a difficult chore to get people over that. I think the, in talking to my counterparts across the Intermountain West, folks are getting that information out um, and looking at how they can improve the sanitation process um, and trying to um, promote the safe environment that people can use, uh, will have in tr using public transportation. Um, when you look at our development pattern um, and right now the high housing costs in the urbanized areas that we have, the service industry folks are going to have to live further away. So that's going to make them um, more dependent upon the public transportation network. And so I think that's going to bring it back. If you look at uh, Uber or Lyft, that's not something you can depend upon for your daily commute um, if you're in the service industry. Um, if you're in a white collar job, yeah, sure. You can use that to help get you from point, to point, point A to point B. But more likely, service industry folks are gonna need to have public transportation to get them to their places of employment. Um, and then there's on-demand on services that um, folks are dependent upon getting to their uh, physicians, et cetera. Um, one of the other areas that we're looking at that I think is viable, um, especially with concerns regarding uh, traveling in airplanes is um, Amtrak. Um, mm. And we lost our um, line um, going through Boise back in the mid nineties, it was 97. Um, and there's some discussion about, is it viable to bring the Pioneer line back? Um, and and so tell me the Pioneer line, what, what would it connect? What? It, I think Portland it, or Portland. Seattle? it was at the time, I think it was Portland. Um, and it went through to, I believe, Salt Lake City. Okay. Um, and so there's discussions about where it would connect on. Um, but from our standpoint, going through the Boise area, um, our region. Um, maybe serving your county as a, 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 your, sorry, your region. Yeah. With some stops. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we had, uh, we at the time, we had three stops, one Caldwell, Nampa, and uh, Boise. Um, and so that would be uh, one discussion point. I think the challenge is, is getting folks over the hump of the belief that public transportation is subsidized through other revenues, um, through taxpayer dollars, and it's not driven by um, a user fee. Mm -hmm. The reality is, if you look at our transport roadway system, it's subsidized. Um, the federal government is funneling general fund into the highway trust fund to keep it solvent. Um, it would have gone insolvent back in September of this year. Um, and Right, without the support from the general. Yeah, and we, they've been funding, funneling that general fund money every transportation bill since... Uh, I think it was the safety loo, um, with safety loo. Um, is, is Idaho beginning to think about distance-based? Um, I, I, I think Utah just passed on electric vehicles. They do a distance-based taxation. Not at present. Um, 
the challenges that um, folks, I haven't heard anything. When we brought it up as far as a vehicle mile travel tax, um, you get folks that are very concerned about Big Brother following what you're doing. The reality is, that's how we get our big data already is through our cell phone. Um, and theoretically, Big Brother's already tracking what you're doing um, because you're allowing them to, when you say yes. Yeah, um, yeah I believe Utah what, just passed a, a vehicle miles travel tax, but only on electrical ve electric vehicles. Back in 2015, when the legislature did a revenue enhancement, gas tax increase, registration fee increase, they also increased um, the registration fee for electric vehicles and um, hybrid vehicles. Um, folks did not lose their minds over the gas tax increase or the registration fee increase. What we did here was folks uh, got upset regarding the hybrids um, having a $150 registration fee. And I, it was either a year or two years later, uh, the legislature removed that requirement um, for hybrids. I think they, they kept it on for the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is Idaho looking at, this is a question from the audience, is, is there tolling or congestion tolling or managed lanes tolling that's happening in Idaho? No, there isn't. Um, part of the challenge is, well, there's a couple challenges. Um, the one challenge is just the size of the population in our region. Uh, our region is about 770,000 people currently. We project by the year 2050, we'll have 1,075,000 people in the region. Um, the demand just isn't there currently, um, where it would be, it would incentivize a private, um, the private sector to come in and help build the capacity on the roadway. Um, and then secondly, um, it's a mentality issue of, um, I, the citizens don't like the idea of tolling. Um, mm. So you see, if tolling were to happen, it'd be through a public-private partnership type thing. At this point in time, yeah. Yeah. And I know some some companies have come in and looked at it for building some of the highways, um, and it just didn't pencil out for them. Um, there will be there's a report coming out um, that we a joint project of a variety of, of trade associations and. Uh, use Boise State University to help do the study that will look at updating our financial shortfalls and also identifying some possibility, possible funding mechanisms. Um, tolling may be one of the ones that's discussed. Um, and I think it does have a future, but it's not an immediate future at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll take a, a few more questions here. Uh, one, one person asks, first off, are you familiar with the National Performance Management Research Data Set, the NPMRD? Yes. And, and so is that, have you found that useful or, or is it something that? Uh... My staff have found it useful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, don't get into, I don't get into it, but my staff have, yes. Okay, right. And then um, the, uh, another question, so with more and more, both for data collection, but also our smart technology, we need, we need uh, better and better telecommunication networks and fiber and for, for the small wireless facilities that are, are being put in. Is, does your MPO get involved with encouraging that or helping it, planning it? What's, what's your role as Boise just continues to grow and grow? At present, we have not been involved in it. Um, that's a state-led issue um, that uh, the governor's office is handling. Um, so we have not been involved. Okay. So, Matt, this has been a, a great chance for a discussion with you, and I, I hope our audience has liked uh, the, the opportunity to um, uh, hear your thoughts on the world. <laughs> we know they're your opinions, but you're, you're thinking about this every day and uh, if we're a large metropolitan area and we, we appreciate hearing, hearing your thoughts. We will, um, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity, appreciate it. Thank you. And you know, we don't have the audience of over a hundred people here to, to clap and give you applause, but we all know that they're, they're there and, uh, and tuned in.